Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. Well, as you've read the title, my name's Paul and I own a dark web courier business. It's not big and I usually don't take in people I don't know. It's usually the same old customers and almost never new ones. I take my customers' privacy very seriously, therefore I don't know much about them. The reason why I'm writing this is because something happened yesterday and I'm not sure what to do. So this brings me to my story. I'll start this story with the only logical place, the beginning. I've always been curious and I've been a little introverted since I started school. Not sure why it just happened to be. Due to my introvert nature, I didn't have many friends in school, so I usually just browse the web. Though I started to get bored of the regular old clear web, sure it did help with the small itch, but when time started to pass, it just didn't do the trick. That's when I learned about Tor. The gateway to the unknown is how I like to see it. Now I'm sure everyone has heard about the dark web and the stories surrounding them. Some of them are true, but most of them are just bullshit. If you see the dark web as the Walmart of drugs, firearms, and hitman services, you'd be right. But it's much, much more than that. Actually, most of it is pretty basic and regular old forums talking to people that can type anything they'd like. It's an uncensored part of the clear web. This is where my story began, with the forums. After you've been on Entepichan for a while, you start to learn your way around the block. So, for those of you who don't know, Entepichan is a forum of sorts. You can find the answer to basically any question in existence. This is where I met my first customer. Let's call this guy Jack, so Jack. He's one of the regulars and I don't know much about him. All I know is that he too owns a business here on the web. I have no idea what this guy does or anything about it. All I know is that I deliver his packages here in my hometown. I take them, deliver them to their respective addresses and be on with it. I pick up the packages at random dead drop locations. I drop them off and get paid through crypto. I'm getting ahead of myself now. Let's start over. So Jack, I met him on NNTP Shan. He messaged me after a post I made about working in the local area and asked me if I was searching for work. I mean, I was skeptical about him, but what do you expect from me? Anyway, I told him that I did. Next thing I know, he messaged me a link to a website. This website was weird? No, unusual. This website was all black with an address written in the middle of the screen with the text, the handicapped toilet under the sink. I looked for it quickly before the website got shut down. Next thing I know is the sound of a message coming from Jack. One o'clock Friday. Don't be late. You'll know where to go when you pick up the package. My first thought was, what the fuck have I gotten into? But I did need the money. I've had troubles with money and as a poor student, a little extra cash on the side couldn't hurt. So, long story short, I did as asked. On Friday, I went to the address which I've decided not to include due to the privacy of my customers. Anyway, the address that I went to was an old gas station at the edge of my small town. And just as Jack had said, the package was under the sink in the handicapped toilet. It wasn't that big. It was a small envelope with a wax seal on it, almost exactly like those you can see in movies or in the library. On my way out, a man grabbed my arm and told me a new address. Go to Redacted 33A, ask for Mr. Williams, and tell him that the sun's up today, shining splendidly over the lake. Then he just let my arm go and walked into the handicapped bathroom. I was a bit stunned at this, but I didn't think much of it. So I did as instructed and biked over to the address given to me from the man in the gas station and knocked on the door. A large man with a long lumberjack-type beard and a face filled with acne scars opened the door. I mean, this man was huge, like probably like six foot four or maybe six foot five even. It took me a while to grasp the man's appearance before I finally said in a trembling and a little awkward voice, Um, I'm looking for Mr. Williams. Is he here possibly? The huge lumberjack looking guy stared into my soul for what felt like minutes before he turned around and called out for a guy named Joe. Not his real name, but I will do. Joe, there's some punk here to see you, he muttered. A few seconds later, a slim, fairly average hype man came to the door and looked at me. 
Mr. Williams, I presume. I said I was trying to sound confident. The man just nodded at me. The sun's up today, shining splendidly over the lake, I said with a bit of unease in my voice while holding out the envelope I had taken from the gas station. The man in front of me, Mr. Williams, looked at me for a few seconds before responding, surely it is a splendid day to take a swim. Before I could react, he snatched the envelope and shut the door on me. I must add that I was a bit confused by what just happened, but I learned later how that came, but that's another story for later. I quickly returned to my bike and biked home. When I came home, I saw that I had an unread message on that pecan. It was Jack, as I suspected. The message read as follows. Well done. The payment has been submitted to your past stated crypto address. I will be in touch if you're interested in working some more. Before I could answer, I had a new payment on my crypto vault. And there it was, a payment of 350 euro. Holy shit, I said silently to myself. I know what you're thinking, only 350 euro. Well, shut up. For me at this time, it was huge. I was a poor student, so leave me alone. So now that we have established my financial supremacy, we can continue. Jokes aside, I was poor and I needed the cash. Let's leave it like that. I quickly sent a message back to Jack. Fuck yeah, man. I'll take everything. Looking back at it now, I kind of regret that statement. For an example, do you understand how fucking hard it is to clean up after some weird liquid that dripped from the pallet the other day? Or, or that time when I had the police search my whole storage facility due to some suspicious marks on one of the boxes I received a few days before. So I told the officers that they can't search my premises without a warrant and probable cause. So the officers turned around and never came back. As I have stated before, I take my customers' privacy extremely serious. Now I don't usually ask what's in the package if it's not something that's in need of special attention, and if so, I don't ask what's in them, rather I ask what special care it needs. I try to refrain from knowing too much, those damn cops aren't going to get anything out of me. Anyway, I continued working for Jack, he's well, one of the regulars. He always wants something delivered on Fridays each week, never to the same house or block, always in different parts of the town. The only consistent thing is that it's always that same looking envelope, that pale white one with that red wax stamp. I try not to think about it, but I'm certainly curious about what's inside of it. I'll get back to all of you some other day. I have a lot more to tell you about my work, but right now it's Friday and I got a delivery to make. You guessed it. It's from Jack as always, but this time it's not an envelope like before. It's a pearl white box with the writing to the man who supplies. I'm not sure what that means and I'm not sure if I want to. Something is telling me that it's not my business, but I'm a curious one. Always has been. Note to the listener of this story. I need advice from you guys. That damn box is eating away at my curiosity. What should I do? I'm tempted to open it. I really am. Yours sincerely, Paul. Let me tell you about these past day. It's driving me insane. I've read all of your comments on the last post and most of you told me not to open it. Something we have to consider though, and I forgot to add the detail that this package doesn't have an address on it, nor does it have a name. It just says, to the man that supplies nothing else. I'm not sure what I should do with it, but I have it in my storage facility. I'll try to contact Jack and tell him that I need an address or that I will be throwing this thing out if he doesn't respond in the coming day or so. Today's story is going to be a little longer than the last one. It seems that you enjoy a longer one, so without further ado, enjoy. I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about myself. Not that anybody asked, but it will help you understand how I think better if you do know me a little. So I'm a bit introverted, which you already know. What you might also know from my general reaction about everything that happened so far. So you might have noticed that I'm a bit paranoid at times. I, however, like to not call it paranoia. I'd rather say that I'm extremely careful. That's a big difference. Something else that you'll need to know is that I think way too much. 
I like to think that my brain does most of the work, while my emotions stay out of it. But that kind of back speaks to my curiosity. If you want to know what I look like, that I will not disclose to you due to my own safety, with me sharing these stories will make me a, let's call it target, for some unwanted attention and friendly visits. I'm not sure what to do, really. I've gotten some unwanted speculators outside of my storage facility recently. First time in a few months, actually. Anyway, I'm not sure what will happen. I posted the last post just before I... Now that current events are all set and you're all caught up with that. Let me tell you more about my other clients. Let's call the next one Miranda. Miranda, you see, she's one of the bigger customers I have and she pays a lot. I'm not talking about college money. We're talking about life-changing amounts of money each year. So you guys might think about my storage facility and why I have it if I'm just a courier. Well, sometimes the pickup day and the delivery date don't add up, so I have to keep it for a while for an extra fee of coursey, no freebies. That the days don't add up rarely happens, but with Miranda, it's probably once a month or so. Her packages vary all the time. Sometimes I'm looking at a small ring-sized box and sometimes I need a whole truck just to fit the damn thing. The strange thing is that the deliveries are never to any houses or people for that matter. I leave them at the same location each time. Now I don't know what she does for a living and I get paid enough to not care so I'm not even going to speculate. But the location who I won't put in name but I can describe it for you or I'll do my best at least. This place where I make all deliveries is an old abandoned warehouse about three hours outside of my town. That probably doesn't tell you a lot, but two hours from my town you haven't even passed by a major city. I think the military used to use this old warehouse for storage back during World War II, but again, I'm not sure. Anyhow, the storage facility is overgrown and huge. I'm talking about a vehicle warehouse size and it's just empty. Sometimes I make deliveries multiple times a day for Miranda, but every single time I get back there, no matter how large the package is, it's always empty. I've thought about checking the place out to see who comes and picks the damn things up, but as I've said before, the privacy of my customers is my priority. Furthermore, with Miranda, she's the one I know most about for some reason. She asked me for advice a few times about social events and stuff like that. Now I know I shouldn't give any advice of that sort, due to my introvert nature, but hey, coaches don't play right. Back to Miranda. So the things I've noticed is that she must be pretty high up socially. I mean, she's going to fancy parties around the capital and other major cities in my country. She also seems to be an entrepreneur of sorts too, due to her way around economics when me and her are talking business. Seems kind of weird to me, but again, she pays enough to make me not question it. All right. It's been about a day since I wrote that last section in this post and I'm writing this from my desk, trying to figure out what to do with this damn thing. I'm sorry I'm getting ahead of myself again. There's two major things have happened since the last post. Let's start off with Miranda. Now Miranda, as I said, is the person I know most about, or so I thought. This probably doesn't make sense to you, but let me tell you that this got me concerned. I got a letter addressed to me not Paul, which is only the name I use in business, but actually my name, addressed to me. How the fuck do they know my name? I spat out. Now this gave me the creep since I am very, very serious with being anonymous. I decided to open the letter. Now this letter was nothing special. I'm not sure how to explain it. It was the most ordinary letter I've ever seen. It's hard to even explain it. It was the most perfect, non-perfect letter ever. It was written in the most beautiful cursive I've ever seen. It said, To Redacted from Miranda. Of course it didn't say Miranda, but due to privacy, I'm not going to disclose her real name. Now this got me curious, so I opened it. All it said was, We need to talk. I can't tell you much over this letter, so meet me at 131 Redacted Street 12, and I'll tell you everything, Miranda. Now I'll tell you this really piqued my interest. In hindsight, I should have just rubbed this off and dropped Miranda as a client. 
Yes, I know I shouldn't have gone. Yes, I know it was stupid even at the time of doing it. But can you blame me? Tell me right now that you wouldn't have so my curiosity got the better of me. They say that curiosity killed the cat, and I don't believe that's just a saying at this point. So let me get you through what happened. Your 4.30 am. I took one of the clean business cars and started driving. I obviously needed a clean car and some kind of backstory to tell my parents on why I'm driving for a solid day to meet up with someone, so I just simply told them that I had a business meeting down south and had to drive down to meet with a potential supplier. Now, this wasn't all false, so it was an easy lie to sell. What can I say? I've become pretty damn good at lying at this point. 0745 p.m., so a long day's drive, just arrived in the city of the meat. I haven't had time to check my phone or anything, but I'm sure I've missed a lot. I'm going to scout out the place before going in. I don't want to be surprised. 08 hour p.m. I've just arrived at the building and it's a newly built house at the coastline. Now I'm no architect, but it looks damn expensive to build. The house is matte gray with large windows covering one of the house's walls and a large garage right next to it, connected to the house with a small flat roof. Now I've scouted this place, I had a pretty decent idea of what the house was and what type of area I was in. So I went in, anxious like a student, before a massive test you haven't studied for. I knocked at the door. One knock. What the fuck am I even doing? Two knocks. Should I just leave and stop the business with her? Just when I was about to knock the third time, a tall, blonde, and pretty good-looking woman opened the door. She eyed me up and down and asked, Are you Paul? With a serious face. Yeah, ease, I answered, weakly. Good, she responded. She invited me into the house and we sat down on the sofa. Do you know why you're here? She asked while not leaving my gaze. No? It said in the letter that everything would be explained here, I answered with a confused face. She looked for me a while before saying, So... I'll be sending a package that's very important to me. She stood up and walked to the window, gazing out at the open waters. Can I trust that you will take care of it? She said bluntly. I thought about it for a moment, but before I could answer, she said, It'll pay good. Double the usual, she said, and turned around looking at me. I was stunned. Double the normal amount was insanely high, so I got even more curious about what it is. What is it? I asked curiously, nothing of your business. All you need to know is that it's very, very valuable to me, so I need it delivered quickly and safely, understood? I thought about it for a while before I answered. Understood, I said confidently. She stood quiet for a while before she said, it's good to have someone to trust, and if you do this for me, I owe you one. We just stood silent for a while before she said, I'll be in touch. I will tell you one day before the package arrives at yours. I nodded and walked back to my car. When I closed the door to my car, I just thought over everything that just happened before I drove home. Not a lot happened after that, really, and it was pretty peaceful. Besides, well, Jack, now I told you in the beginning of this post that there were two major events that happened during these days. Well, this was the second, so this is where my anxiety and paranoia kicks in real fucking hard. So you guys remember that package I asked if I should open? Well, I decided not to, so I didn't get an answer from Jack about it. It was just quiet. So I decided to throw it out right before I drove down to meet with Miranda. So you could have guessed what was waiting for me at the exact same place as I picked up that box. It was a new one that looked the same. Exact same text and everything. I don't know what to do with it. I mean, to the man who supplies. What the fuck is that even supposed to mean? I tried to message Jack again asking about that fucking package. No response again. So, my anxiety level was at top, and I didn't want anything to do with this damn package. So I did the exact same thing as last time. I threw it out. Now what was I supposed to do with it? I mean, it's not addressed to me, is it? Why would it be me? It wouldn't make sense. The man who supplies, what do I supply? I'm just a damn courier. And besides that, who would send me anything? They already pay for the services. That's more than enough for me. Now today, it's Friday. 
and Friday is supposed to be a pickup from Jack. So I drove down to the gas station and went into the handicapped toilet as I usually did. But under the sink, there was no envelope. It was a note and it read, Paul, why haven't you opened my gift? I thought you trusted me more than that. Anyway, I'd like you to go talk to the cashier. They have a, how should I say it, a special offer for you. We have always been pleased with your quality of work, so we want you to do something for us. I read the note as I stood in the toilet comprehending what I just read. Fuck, 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 not now, I said to myself. This wouldn't have been a big deal if it wasn't for the job that I was supposed to get from Miranda. I mean that I needed my whole attention to perform. She did say that it was very valuable for her, so I certainly don't want to lose it. Who knows what she can do to me if it gets lost or damaged. I didn't want to take that risk. Anyway, back to the gas station. I followed what the note had said. I walked up to the cashier and he looked at me with a serious face. Hey man, what's up? I said with confidence. The cashier just looked at me and nodded towards the door in the back. So I did as I was told and went into the back of the station. When I entered the back door, I was greeted by two large dudes almost looking like your average bouncer outside of the clubs. They were huge. They closed the door behind me as I proceeded to the manager's office. Thank you for coming, I heard a voice say right before I went into the office. I turned around sharply to look at a short fat man who seemed to be around his 30s or 40s. He proceeded to usher me into the office, so I assumed this was the manager. He signed me to sit down while he went and poured two glasses of whiskey and placed one of the glasses in front of me. Hello, Paul, my name's Jack, he said while taking a sip of his whiskey. I got a gift for you, old friend. He proceeded to open a drawer by the desk. I just sat quiet, waiting for him to get to the point. I had literally no idea what I should have done, and I honestly don't know even after what was the right choice. Jack continued to take up a box. I recognized it right when I saw it. What the fuck is that? I said, quite annoyed to Jack. It's a gift, he said, and placed the box on the desk on the right of me. I need you for something, he said with a small grin on his face. You're delivering packages by a competitor of mine. I'd like you to do one final delivery for her, he said with a serious face again. It has come to my knowledge that a package is going to arrive at your establishment, he said with a lack of a better word. I'd like you to take it and put it in this box, he said while looking at me. He finished his drink and signed for me to do the same. Can you do that for me? He asked while staring into my soul. Now I don't know what to answer to this. I'm sure that if I didn't agree, I wouldn't come out of this damn place alive. So I did what any sensible person would do. Yes, for the right price, I said with a smirk. Jack looked at me for a solid minute with not even a blink before he spoke again. One million, he said looking at me. Holy shit, I thought to myself trying not to show my excitement. Now that was a lot of money, I'll tell you. It was far more than what Miranda had offered me to take care of the package. This is where the internal debate began. Should I take it or should I stay true to my word with Miranda? I had no idea what to say, so I just said, Sure thing, boss while I sat back in the chair. Jack looked at me and nodded slowly. Good, we'll be in touch when you have the package, he said while pouring another glass for himself and offering me one. I declined the extra glass and thanked him for the opportunity and left the gas station. It's now evening and I'm sitting at my desk looking at a small box sent by Miranda, just staring at it trying to decide what to do. I'll update you all when I've decided what I should do. I guess it's going to be another long night with no sleep. Edit. I messaged Miranda this night, shit spiraling out of control. I'll update you all when, or rather if I can. If I can't, well thanks for reading. Sincerely yours, Paul. Before I start this story, I just want to thank you all for your support. I understand that some of you might have been concerned for my safety and therefore I'm obliged to tell you that I'm fine. Actually, more than fine, but I'll tell you more about that later. I also saw a comment that told me that I was, you didn't know what to do with the package, so you threw it away, twice, 
knowing what these people are like and how expensive everything seems to be. No one would do that. I'm sorry, that's ridiculous and completely idiotic. Now I can't blame you. I understand why you're telling me that my choice to do so was idiotic. It would have been if it weren't for the cops that had started to pop up outside of my warehouse. This was what I meant with unwanted attention and friendly visits. So when I get a package with no address, and when I ask people around about it and get no answer, I just assume that it's there to expose me, kill me, or hurt me. Now that I've explained that, let's get into today's story. I fucked up. Not your regular old oopsies I came late to work kind of fuck up. Rather a oopsie I'll probably get tortured until I die in front of people on the dark web kind of fuck up. Before I tell you about my fuck up, let me warn you. Never make a deal that fucks someone over. Not sure if you understood me, but never make a deal that fucks someone over, especially if it's on the dark web. Yet again, I don't recommend you being on the dark web. Sure, it might be boring, but boring and alive is much better than excited and dead. Don't make my mistake. No amount of money is worth dying for. Or that was a lie. Everyone has a price. This was mine. So it's been a little hectic since my last post. Everything has gone downhill since then. But let me start with the beginning of everything. It's the morning after I got that fucking package. I haven't been able to sleep tonight, so I've decided to do this all right. It might not be the smartest fucking idea I've had in my entire life, but I mean I had to screw over someone. So I decided to message Miranda. I made a deal with her first. She was the better paying of them over time. I know I'm greedy, but hell if I'm risking my fat ass for something, I'd rather do it for money than morale. Judge me as much as you want. I don't fucking care now. It's already been done. Off track again, fuck. I need to write it down. If not, my story will never be heard. Well, I messaged Miranda. Hey, Miranda, it's Paul. We need to fucking talk. Right now, call me when you can. And God is my witness, she answered in what felt like seconds. Shit, all right. I'm in the area. I'll meet you. Come to the place you drop off the packages for me. One hour. Don't be late. And there was nothing more to it. Before I left, I packed up my laptop, burner phones, and made some sandwiches. I wasn't planning on actually coming back. Before I left, I took out the 45 ACP I had under the desk in case of some hooligans trying to get to me. After quickly packing down the gun, I took the small box that I had received from Miranda and went on my way to the location given to me. Upon arrival, I saw a gathering of cars outside the old warehouse, and as I proceeded to park my car beside one of the vehicles standing there, I picked up my gun and tugged it down the back of my pants. I walked in to be greeted by Miranda. Hey Paul, thanks for meeting up. Do you have the package? She said with a cheery voice. Yeah, I do. What is in this damn thing that made Jack willing to pay a fortune to get it? I asked in a serious tone. Well, since you didn't fuck me over, she said as she gestured to give her the box. I hesitated for a second before I slowly handed her the package. Thank you, she said while inspecting the box for damage. She opened the box and took out a small glass box with metal corners. Inside of the glass box was a small purple black ball that looked to be pulsating. This, she said while shaking the little box, this is the first confirmed black matter piece created by humans. I just stood with a confused face. You're kidding, right? I said with a small chuckle. Her face went all serious in an instant, almost like I had offended her just by asking. Yes, of course I'm serious, she said in an annoyed tone. How? Why? Why me? I said, confused. Well, she said while putting the glass box down. I've never had an issue with you or your deliveries the past year, so I didn't think it would be now. She sounded genuine. I just nodded and said, What should we do about Jack? If we do nothing, I'll be dead. I said seriously, almost threatening. Miranda just looked at me with a straight face not breaking an inch. We probably stood there for a solid minute or so before she finally spoke. I think it's time to change the management at Jack's organization, she said with a half smile. She nodded to one of the guards that were there to come over. She continued to whisper something in his ear before looking back at me. 
I need your help. I need you to lure Jack out. Do you know what to do with that box you told me about? Not sure, I said, thinking what to do next. I suppose I'll message Jack and ask. I continued. She nodded, and I started to write to Jack. Hey, man. So I got what I promised you. What do you want me to do with it? I typed out before clicking send. It didn't take longer than a few seconds before I got a message back. Perfect, let's meet at the gas station. He wrote back to me. He wants to meet up, I said to Miranda. She thought about it for a while before speaking. Then so be it, she said before using me along to another room. She pulled out an empty glass box exactly like the other one before dropping down a marble on the small stand that the glass box contained. This should do it, she said with a smirk and handed me the box. Give him this, she said, not stopping to smirk. Now I thought this was fucking crazy, but what choice did I have? I had already played my hand with Miranda, so I went to the gas station. Before I even pulled up to the gas station, I got a strange feeling in my gut. It's hard to explain. It was almost like a primal instinct kicked in that told me to get away from there as fast as I could bear. Now, since I must be fucking stupid, I didn't listen to my gut. I continued to pull up to the gas station. I walked up to the cashier, but before I even could open my mouth, something hit me in the back of the head. Fuck, man, why did you hit him so fucking hard? The boss told us to keep him alive. I heard a deep voice say, Shut the fuck up, Roger. You do it next time if it's so fucking easy, eh? The other man said with a harsh tone. He's starting to wake up, said Roger. I tried to move, but my hands and legs were tied up, so I just kind of wobbled on the concrete floor like a fish on land or a snake stuck on ice. They continued to drag me, and I must have hit my head again because I passed out just to wake up in what looked like a basement. I was still tied up, of course, and I could hear people talking outside. The boss will come any second, a male voice said. Yeah, this show is going to be fantastic, said another guy outside the door. Both people started laughing until I heard what sounded like gunfire outside. Hey, what was that? said the first guy. I don't know, man. I'll go check it out, the second guy said. Not long after I heard two heavy thuds, something I can just assume was the two guards falling to the floor. The basement door slowly crept open as a dark figure stood at the doorway with a silenced goon in its hand. Now I was scared, scared for my life. I thought it was me this guy was after. So I started crawling the best I could the other way from this figure. Now I've been hit pretty damn hard in my head so my vision was a bit faded. I mean shit, it still is. I was more scared than I have ever been when he came down those stairs. It felt like hours as he took one step. Why the fuck did I get myself into this shit? Two steps. Man, I regret it. I regret it all. Three steps. Leave me the fuck alone. I yelled at the figure walking towards me. I'm not here to hurt you. The figure said in a deep voice, probably the deepest I've ever heard. We did promise you safety, the figure said. What the fuck does this person mean? Safety? Who promised me fucking safety? The boss wants to talk to you, the figure said. I was easily picked up by the figure. I tried to get away as much as I could, but it got me in a strong grip. I was put in the back of a van, and we drove for... I don't even know how long. I fell back and forth out of consciousness on the trip, but we finally arrived. I blinked frantically trying to adjust to the light outside the van. You all right, man? A female voice said. Miranda? I said, confused. Hey guys, can you cut those things off? Let him move Jesus. I heard the female voice say, to what I assumed was the figure from before. Yes, of course, ma'am, the figure said. He proceeded to cut the rope around my hands and legs and I could feel my muscles loosen its tension. Thank you, I mumbled harshly. The female that I now could see clearer was Miranda. I couldn't believe it, I was going to live. It's over, Miranda said. Jack won't be a problem for none of us anymore. Thank you, I owe you she said with a soft smile. Now that all that is over, I got a proposition for you, she said with a grin. So I have to stop here and tell you something that has a lot of value to what I'm about to tell you. 
So you guys don't know yet what I studied. If this was yesterday. I'd prefer not to say, but as you know, it's not yesterday. Anyway, I studied molecular physics at a prestigious university in northern Sweden. Yes, also a thing that you guys didn't know about me yet. I also studied astrophysics in my spare time. So yes, you could say that I'm fairly smart. Now that that's over, I'll get back to the story. Miranda ushered me forward into this cabin at a lakeside. We walked into a large dinner table that was too big for the room. She looked at me with that serious face she had when we talked business. I'd like to offer you a position at a project that's going to change the future. I could need your expertise in a, let's call it a project of mine, she said with that same smirk as before. I thought about it for a second because I don't want to be dragged into some crazy shit as I just got dragged into it, but I had to ask. What? Project? I asked with a serious face, not really convinced on the whole project idea yet. She looked around for a bit and nodded to the guards to leave the room. It must have been minutes before she finally decided to speak. Time travel, she said looking at me like it was something that she had been holding in forever. I understand how it sounds, but I'm not joking. That little piece of dark matter will change the world, she said and glared of into the distance like she was dreaming herself away. Money won't be a problem. Me and my organization got enough to last you a million lifetimes. She continued not leaving her gaze. What's the catch? I said jokingly while giving her a little smile. You're going to have to leave everything behind and never look back. She said, not looking at me with a slightly sad expression. We sat quiet for a while before I finally told her. Where do I sign up? So tell me that this isn't something you'd say yes to also. Sure, you're going to basically stop existing publicly, and all your family will think you've died. But sometimes, life is too short to pass upon opportunities that present itself in the worst times possible. My dad always told me to do the things I thought were impossible, and this certainly was considered impossible. So I'll be in touch if I discover the universe's final secret until then. Sincerely yours, Paul. Listeners, please beware. This message is an automatic voice message and could be flawed due to hasty time station errors. Trans time script takes no further responsibility for the following message, and all complaints are to be forwarded directly to headquarters at 4137 Armstrong Avenue, Latilia Valley, Mars. Our in office times are as follows Monday, Thursday, 07 45 16 45, Fridays, 12 via 14 30, Saturday, closed. Sunday, closed. If you need assistance in an emergency situation, please refer to the safety protocol found on the backside of your trans time script machine. Start transcript. God damn it, stupid machine. Please fucking work for once. Ancient piece of shit is how it sounded before I started typing this message out. Now I get that you might be a little bit confused right now, but you shouldn't. Everything is fine here. Now I'm not sure which date or even year it is for you. I was planning on hitting this around 8 p.m. on the 20th of June, 2022. Hopefully I've hit it right. If not, tough shit. Who am I joking? I know this went through at the right time. I mean, it was me. Now, as you've probably already figured out, I made it. Ha ha. I invented time travel. Suck it, Einstein. All right, it might have been a bit of a road there and not as fluent as you'd like, but hey, fuck you. You didn't invent it. I make the rules. So, it's pretty damn simple now. You press a button and then, poof. You're where you want. Isn't that cool? All right, there is more to it then that now time travel isn't exactly viable yet and I've only managed to send messages back in time so far, which you're reading right now. So that's pretty cool, I guess. Now it's been pretty chill since we last spoke. It feels like forever. Now for me, it's been almost 30 years, but for you, it's only been a few hours a day-ish, right? Anyway, you guys might want to know how this even happened and let me tell you. So Miranda, she's... Well dead. Now Miranda happened to be a very good friend of mine, so I was saddened by this, to be honest. So I will not speak about this any further, because if I do, I know I would have stopped it. Now you all have some questions about the future, so let me answer some of them for you. To begin with, games. Yes, 
Most of the questions were actually about games, and I have two things to say about it. First of all, nerd. Second of all, you've jinxed it. So Half-Life 3? No, no, that's not happening. They teased it to get some funding, then the developers cashed out and ran with the cash. GTA 6 actually happened, but it was delayed out the window, and the game was mostly shit, to be honest. They decided to link GTA Online between GTA 6 and GTA 5, so it was basically the same game. Kinda sad. There were also some worries about me going back in time and making them not exist. Now how important that would be or not does not really interest me. All I can say about it is simple. Watch your back. I might go back just to smack you to make you be on edge again. Now jokes aside, let me tell you about the development of the trans time script. Now this was my genius idea. Hopefully you all got the joke. You know, transcript and time cause it's time travel. Yeah, you get it, man, I've gotten older. I remember how my younger self hated that joke, therefore I had to do it again. Now the development of this has been kept in secret as part of the deal with Miranda when I got this damn job. Now I've been officially dead ever since that day I took that job. Everyone thinks I got killed in a gas explosion at my warehouse. Both me and Miranda thought this was a genius idea and it just so happened to be just that. So you see I have had a grand time up until this very moment actually because I've been trying to send this message probably around a million times by now over the whole development phase. So if this is the one that went through, whoop whoop. Let me tell you about this apparatus. This thing looks like an old PC from the 90s with a built-in screen. It has what we call a FDR or flux disk reader. Now these flux disks are amazing, I'm telling you. They're about the same size as a microchip, but can fit up to one petabyte of storage so far. Now these disks are what I use to send this message. They're all different from each other and is also one of my own little inventions. This machine doesn't have a keyboard though. It only has a screen that shows the information you need and nothing more. So you can't really browse the internet through it, nor can you really do anything with it besides that. It's not that exciting looking at it like that, but trust me, it's pretty dope. So today's story comes as a warning rather than a brag about time travel. You see, only one of these messages came through out of the thousands that I sent out. Now we got a response, and it wasn't from me. This is how it read. Log entry NRC14WT3R76509. Hello? Is... is there anyone there? If you can hear me, please help me. I've been stuck here for centuries. Please help. Fuck, I should have never agreed to this shit. Fuck. Transmission ended. Now this really had me spooked up. Who the fuck would even know about this thing besides me? I'm the only one that knows about this. The others in the team don't know what we do here. They mostly do calculations without knowing what the end goal is. So you see why this had me spooked, but this wasn't the creepiest part. I got this message a few days ago too. Log entry. NRC42. 3R76510. Come on, you fucking idiot. It's me, Big Red. Can you please fucking help me? I'm going insane in here. Transmission ended. Now this really made me scared shitless, so you see, I'm Big Red. It's what my dad always used to call me when I was, well, officially alive. But you see, Big Red is what I usually want to call myself on the internet or in other anonymous situations. Fuck me, I said out loud in my office when I read this the first time. You see, there's a few options to what has actually happened, and none of them is good. Now these are my two hypotheses that I think are equally likely, or well, I guess unlikely. Hypothesis one. The first hypothesis is that I've managed to make a time loop of sorts when trying to send out these messages. So basically, when you send something back in time, what you actually do is that you create an exact copy of that timeline. So everything is identical from start to finish on this line besides this exact little thing. That one of the timelines managed to receive a message and the other didn't. Now this means basically that we split time in two, which could result in one of them getting tangled. Now if the one where I have successfully invented the trans time script gets tangled up, it could create an infinite loop where time repeats the exact same over and over again, while the person in the loop keeps living the same moments. The body doesn't deteriorate or anything, but the mind remembers everything. 
almost like Groundhog Day, you know, that old movie from 1993 with Bill Murray and Andy McDowell? Perhaps not. Anyway, this would result in that the other me of sorts would try to contact out of this loop to try to get it resolved, not knowing how to. Now some of you might know the issue here. If that me doesn't know how to, why would I think that this me could? Point proven. Hypothesis 2. Now the second hypothesis is actually pretty simple. I've managed to contact myself, but from the future where I've perhaps been able to invent human travel through time. If this is the case, I've made a grave mistake and probably gotten myself in a messed up time paradox. If that happens, tough luck me. Now that second option would be, well, tragic for me. Now the second hypothesis is more likely in my unprofessional opinion but I guess it's exactly the same probability to be. The only thing that's certain is that I wish to be in the timeline where it works out and not the timeline where, well, you know. So Paul, this is for you. Don't mess with time. You don't know the precautions on what you're about to do. You're messing with forces that you know nothing about. Even to this day, you still don't know shit. When you start messing with time, you start messing with existence. The only reason why I still do this is because of Miranda. Well, the only reason why we're still doing this is because of Miranda. You'll understand one day when you're older. Now to you readers. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you have the option to travel in time or mess with things you get a bad feeling about. Listen to that bad fucking feeling, all right? Those feelings, dude, are the things that keep you alive, dumbass. That's the feelings that is carved into your DNA to keep you out of danger. Also, before I forget, Paul, don't listen to the man with the um. Transmission ended. Now that post yesterday really had me spooked. I'm not going to lie to you. I've been feeling watched lately which is particularly odd due to the fact that I'm working alone in a basement with no windows. I usually just shrug it off like it was nothing but that last post from myself. It had me startled. You see, I wasn't planning on writing anything for a while, but it seems that God, or whatever, got other plans for me. Now, who is that man I was talking about? Why shouldn't I trust him? When will I meet this figure? These were just a few of the questions I had after reading that last post. Right now, I'm trying to figure this thing out, so I'm reading it back and forth until loud knocks could be heard from the glass door behind me. Hey, Paul, get your ass out here. I need you to meet someone. I heard Miranda shout from outside the door. Coming right away, I shouted back as I quickly closed the laptop. Now, I can't say I didn't flinch when I heard the knocking from Miranda. I probably visibly jumped a little from my chair as the knocking was heard. I'm usually not the type to get easily spooked, but it was something unnerving about the warning that I just couldn't shake. I brushed off the light heart attack I just endured and walked out of my lab. Finally, Miranda said as she stood up to meet me, let me introduce you to my business partner, Jacob. She said with a half smile and that cheering tone she usually has. Now Jacob wasn't that tall, he had dark hair with a few gray hairs sticking out, bright blue eyes and he was wearing a long trench coat. Jacob could use one less sandwich, but he wasn't fat by any means. He was what people would describe as chubby. Nice to meet you, sir, I said, and gave the man a firm handshake. Hey there, nice grip, kid, he said with a slight chuckle. Thank you, I said while giving Miranda a slightly awkward look before I took a few steps back from Jacob. We should probably get going, Miranda said to Jacob. Before the left, Miranda turned around and gave me an understanding wink like she had just saved me from an awkward position. I mouthed a quiet thank you before I returned to the lab to continue my studies. Not long after this, I was interrupted with a knock on my door. I turned around to see Jacob standing outside the glass door, gesturing to me to unlock it. I walked over the door and he locked it before returning back to the soldering iron. Nice place you got here. What are you working on? Jakob said enthusiastically. Nothing special, I said, not taking my eyes off the modem I was soldering. What's this then? Jakob asked curiously. I turned around to see what he was looking at, and it was then I realized who the man I had warned myself for was. I solidified on the spot. What? How? Why shouldn't I trust him? I thought to myself. 
My thoughts were going haywire at this point. Miranda trusts him, so why shouldn't I? I asked myself. Snap. 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 It was Jacob. He snapped his fingers in front of my face. Hey, you good there, buddy? You look like you've seen a ghost, he said, looking at me with a strange look. Y yeah I mustered out. I have to go, I said hastily as I got my bag with the laptop and walked out of the lab. Hey, we... was all I could hear from Jacob before I had exited the room. I hastily walked through the long underground hallway that led to a massive dinner hall. I rounded the pillar at the back of the dining hall to Miranda's office. I opened her door without even knocking and closed it hastily. We need to talk, I said with what I thought was a serious face. You all right there, Paul? Miranda asked, slightly concerned. You look like you've just seen a ghost, she said, both a little worried and intrigued at the same time. I've done it, I said. What do you mean? Have you done it, it, or what? She said, surprised and excited. Yes, I mean no. Fuck, it's hard to explain. I said, waving my arms in the air like a madman. All right, all right, calm down. Miranda said, gesturing me to sit down at the chair in front of her desk. Tell me what's up, she said, leaning back into the chair. So I told her, I told her everything. Wow. She stuttered before scratching her head for a bit. I just sat in silence. There wasn't much I could say, really. This whole thing was just weird. There's not really a handbook that you can look at when it comes to time travel, so you gotta be fairly cautious. I get all that stuff, she said while not stopping to think. It's just one thing I don't really understand. Why shouldn't you trust Jacob, she said afterwards. Frankly, I don't know, I said, but it's what it said, I followed up. Now this might all sound a bit confusing, but trust me, you'll understand soon enough. You see, I recognized Jacob. I couldn't pinpoint why or where I had seen him, but I was sure I had. He felt familiar like I've always known him somehow, but I was sure I didn't know who he was. All right, Miranda said worryingly. If all this mumbo is real, we better be careful, she followed up. For now, we should pretend like nothing is wrong, I told Miranda. She nodded slowly before gesturing me to leave the room. I did as I was told and walked back to the lab. I didn't think about Jacob that much. I tried not to, quite frankly. The hours went by without a word being spoken, until Jacob cleared his throat and asked, So, how's the project going? How far have you come? He said a little hesitantly. Um, yeah, it's going good. I'm just now finishing up what I'd like to call a flux disc reader, I said with a smirk. But the face of Jacob dropped, and we were interrupted by sirens shouting. Security breach, intruder alert, Please make your way to the nearest security room. It repeats itself over and over as me and Jacob looked at each other before he said, Well, that was unexpected, he said with a brief pause. We took off to the nearest security room. The security rooms were fairly large rooms made out of concrete, with spotlights in the ceiling highlighting capsule or pod-like machines on the far wall of the room. In the middle of the room was a table with clothes that looked like something out of Fallout 4. Hey, happily surprised to see you two here. I heard Miranda's voice behind us. She shut the door behind her, locking it with a control panel on the left side of the door. That should do it, she said, brushing off dust from her hands. Before I could react, Jacob pushed me into one of the pods in the back of the room, closing it shut. Hey, what the fuck, man? Are you crazy? I yelled out, banging on the pod glass window. It had to be done big red, he yelled back, dragging out a gun from his back. He pointed the gun at Miranda, telling her to be calm. You should have listened, Jacob said. The glass on the pod was starting to fog up, and I felt dizzy. But I couldn't stop watching as I punched the glass window. Come in fucking break already, I yelled as the window started to crack. My head felt more and more heavy as I started to fade out. Bang! A gunshot was heard outside, followed by a heavy thud into the concrete floor. It was Jacob who had been shot. Miranda at her knees looking at someone in another pod. What? What? How? It doesn't make sense. She stumbled out before I heard a voice. I'm sorry I have to, it said. Miranda fell to the floor after being hit with some kind of stick-shaped thing. 
I passed out and woke up in the facility's nursery. Snap. Snap, the nurse's fingers snapped. Welcome back, sleepy head, one of the nurses said. I sat up in the bed rubbing my head. What happened? I asked the nurse in pain. What do you mean? We found you in those old security rooms, whatever you were doing there, the nurse said with a smile. I rubbed my face for a bit, realizing that it felt different. I looked around the room, realizing that it wasn't the facility's nursery I've seen before. It was something else. It was the same room. Don't get me wrong. Even that picture on the wall with the men in black quote was still there. 1,500 years ago, humans knew that the Earth was the middle of the solar system. 500 years ago, humanity just knew that the Earth was flat. 15 minutes ago, you just knew that we were alone in the universe. Now imagine what we just know tomorrow. I always found that quote quite inspiring, actually. Hey there, hotshot, said a voice behind the nurse. You all right there? The man chuckled. I didn't recognize the man. He was dressed in a lab coat with pens and instruments in its pockets. He held a clipboard under his arm when he approached me. The man looked to be in his thirties, slightly older than me. He had shoulder-long dark hair and he was quite muscular. So how did it go? Was it a success? The man asked while waving away the nurses. I looked at the man with a confused look before I asked, I'm sorry, but who are you and how did I end up here? The man chuckled a little bit before continuing. You told me this would happen. My name is Earl, and I took over after your disappearance ten years ago. Your time travel project of sorts, he said with a grin. Let me show you our progression, he said, ushering me along through the facility. The place I've come to know was the same at its core, but everything looked so surreal. It was modern, everything was white, and the lights hanging from the ceiling had a light blue glow coming out of them. I didn't really listen to Earl when we walked through the labs and testing halls. I was too occupied thinking about what Jakob had said before. It had to be done by Big Red. Why would he say that? How the fuck did he know about it? Also, why do I recognize him? I dove deep into my memories. I've never met this guy before. That's when it hit me. I stopped dead in my tracks, saying out loud, Fucking hell, man. Earl stopped and watched me with a confused look. Hey, you good there, buddy? He said with a half-concerned smile. I got something that I need to do. I said, Have you cracked time travel yet? I asked Earl. How did you know? He asked me, confused. It's classified and no one knows yet. It was right before I found you I managed it. He said, realizing what was happening. You're not from around here, right? He said with a smirk. I looked at him for a while before answering. No, no, I'm not. I said with a serious face. What are we waiting for then? He chuckled and quickened his pace. We shortly reached one of the labs hidden down in the basement where a strange machine stood hooked up with one of the old emergency capsules that I had been standing in before. Huh, figures, I whispered under my breath. Step right in, he said as he held his hand out, gesturing for me to step into the capsule. I did as I was told, as usual. Found that doing that is the easiest way to continue to be alive. Anyway, he started to hook up a few different cables onto me before handing me a loaded gun. Just in case, he said with a wink before he shut the door to the capsule. Red flashing lights could be seen inside the room, and a mechanical voice could be heard in the background. Please, stand back while the red light is flashing. Please proceed with the given instructions. The mechanical voice repeated itself multiple times. The sound started to fade out to white noise and I could see bright flashes of a color I'm not able to describe with words, but the feeling I got was emptiness. I felt nothing. It wasn't a light, it was more of an absence of light. The color blind people see, I guess you can say, when suddenly I could see again and I could hear. Outside of the capsule I could hear the faint noise of two people speaking. It was Jacob. I could hear him repeating the words I've just recently heard him say. You should have listened, I heard. I could hear myself pounding at the glass before the capsule opened, and I stepped out. Bang! I fired. Jacob's body dropped to the ground like a sack of potatoes with his gun falling to the ground with him. 
Miranda looked at me with a scared, confused look before she burst out. What, what? How? It doesn't make sense. I picked up a metal pipe that laid on the floor beside me. I'm sorry, I have to, I said. With a sad face, I heightened the pipe and hit Miranda in the head with the pipe. Only a few seconds later, security came rushing into the room. What happened here? One of the guards pointed the weapon at me. He tried to shoot her. I, I, I killed him, I answered with shame. You see, I had never killed a man, and I wasn't planning on doing so either. But I guess that in this type of industry, it's something that you eventually will have to do. Whether or not you want to or not, it does not matter. The guards lowered his weapon to my waist before nodding to the others to bring me out of there. They took Miranda to the nursery, where she woke up a few hours later. W where am I? She said softly, still trying to grasp what had happened. What happened? She asked me, confused as to why she was in the nursery. Now, this was good. I didn't want her to know about the time traveling. I looked at her with a faint smile. Jacob turned on you, I said. That piece of shit. She coughed out when she tried to sit up. I was supposed to have an interview today with a new guy for your lab, she said with a small smile. Could you take it for me? She asked with a smile. Of course, I said, as I put a hand on her shoulder before leaving for the office. Hey, there is this the interview room, said a voice behind me. I smirked as I turned around to see Earl. I tapped my clipboard as I looked up at Earl. So, Earl? I faked a confused look. What's your credentials? I said. Looking back at my workstation, I couldn't help but to smile a little. I knew so much more than he could even imagine. Um, I, I, he said with a slight stutter. I used to work with nuclear reactors and I've had an internship for the past year at an atomic research facility, he continued. I smiled again and turned around. No, no, not professional credentials, I said, shaking my head. What do you do in your spare time? I asked with a smile again. Well, what? Earl smiled and slightly chuckled. I'm not sure I follow, he said, looking at me with a slight smile. I smiled back and looked at him with a serious face before that face turned into a faked, hopeless smile. I have no choice, you've convinced me. I said, shaking my head and waving my hands in the sky. You're hired, I said, pointing a finger at him in a joking manner. Oh, all right, no actual questions, he said with a surprised look. What do you mean? I've learned everything I need to know already, I said with a serious face. I got everything set up in the lab for you, I told him, ushering him out of the office. We took a walk through the facility and I showed him around all the rooms he'll soon come to know. My thoughts drifted away as I started to ask myself what I'm doing. I started to doubt the career choice I'd made going here. I missed the simple life I thought before I heard someone calling my name. Paul, Paul. I hear Miranda call. What's up? I gestured for Earl to stay. How's he looking? Miranda asked, glancing over to Earl. He's a good kid, I said with a smile of remembrance. All right, she said. So what do you think? Should we hire him? She asked. She looked like she didn't like him that much. I already did, I said, smiling back. He might save your life one day, I said with a smirk. I highly doubt it, but all right, she said with a chuckle before going back to the nursery. I walked back to Earl and continued with the tour. We talked about old television shows we watched when we were young as we made our way through the long corridors. This place needs some white walls, he said while looking around the rooms. I laughed a little before I finally spoke. Yeah, sure, Earl, I trust your judgment, I said, looking down at the floor with that same thankful smile. You see, I haven't known Earl for very long, but I knew I could trust him. I mean, he did save both mine and Miranda's life after all, so that counts as something good in my books. A few hours went by and I got no work done. I just stared around the room not thinking about anything besides the past days. Why do I do this again? I thought to myself as I scratched my head. Sure, it's cool and all, but I'm not up for this shit. I continued to myself. I stood up and started walking back and forth in the room. I'm going to quit. I stopped as I thought it. 
I walked quickly over to a cupboard I had in the corner of the lab. I picked up a notepad and started writing. Hey, Earl, I can't do this anymore. I need to get away from this stuff, but trust me, you'll fit right in. That's why I'm giving you full control of this project and everything that we've established so far. Everything you need to know is in the laptop, and if you have any problems with Miranda, tell her I told you it was fine, all right? Anyway, we'll meet one day, and I will tell you how everything went. But all you need to know is that I won't know you, I won't recognize you. That's all you need to know. God's speed friend, I owe you my life. Your friend, Paul. That's what the note said. I ripped it off the notepad and unlocked my laptop. I quickly wrote out a message and sent it to Miranda. I'm sorry, but I can't do this. I'm putting Earl in control of this project, and you must trust me. If you do not let Earl work on this thing, I'll be dead, and so will you. So listen to me carefully. He's the key to time travel. He's the one that will invent it. I know it. I can't tell you how I know I don't have time. You just have to trust me. Good luck, old friend. I wish you the best. I pressed send before leaving my laptop in the lab with the note attached to it folded in half. Right as I was about to walk out of the lab, I met Earl in the doorway. He had a look of confusion and concern as he looked at me and then at the laptop, then back at me again. You good there, boss? He asked with a raised eyebrow. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I'm just hungry. Are you hungry? I said with a stressed voice. Come, let's get something to eat, I said, dragging him along towards the dining hall. Oh, shit, I almost forgot, I said to Earl. He turned around as we approached the dining hall. I need to do something. I said, turning around. Earl looked at me strangely, but he let me leave. I walked hasty towards the stairs that led to the exit. When I reached the stairs, I walked up them trying to look as normal as I could. Good day, fellas, I said, bowing my head slightly to the guard standing at the exit. Good day, Paul, the right guard said with a slight nod. I opened the door to the exit and walked over to my car. I started it up and drove off. I drove for... I don't know how long before I came out to a small town gas station. I filled my tank up and continued to drive off. I drove for hours upon hours before I finally arrived at my destination. My old warehouse. You see, I'm writing this from my old desk where I once conducted business, and I feel like I need to explain some realizations that I've come to know recently. First of all, let me clear up some things about Jacob. You know how, in part four of this story, one of the hypotheses was that time travel basically only splits the timeline in two equally probable outcomes of an action. You see, I now know why I recognize Jacob. Jacob isn't really Jacob. He's, well, me, but older and from one of the timelines where I hold a grudge against Miranda for dragging me into this mess. A grudge big enough for me to travel back in time to kill Miranda before we had the ability to invent time travel. I mean, it's my best guess and I think I'm not far off, sadly. Another thing that I want to clear up is why I even write this. Well, I had to. If I didn't, the future wouldn't turn out as it's supposed to. So now you might understand why this all has happened, and I will give you the pleasure of knowing my real name. I mean, I don't exist anymore anyway. Miranda made sure of that. So let me tell you a dead man's tale. My name's Charlie, Charlie North. I'm still a dark web courier, and these were my stories. Let me know in the comments if you want to hear Charlie North's dark web courier horror stories.